Well, hi guys. Look, welcome uh, to the first joint ISRM ACES webinar. My name is Gary Bergen. Um, I've effectively got two foots or, or a foot in both camps here today as both the, the vice chair of ISRM Ireland and vice chair of the ACES Ireland chapter. Just to give you guys an update on what's what, what's going on in, in, in ACES and in um, in the ISRM. On September the, the, the 2nd at 8.30 in the morning, we have an ISRM strategic leadership breakfast meeting um, with Tobias Elwood. Uh, who is the chair of the Commons Committee on Defence. Um, the November the 8th to the 12th, we have the level four and five awards for the foundations in security management and risk management and the awards in corporate and risk and crisis management. Um, on November the 30th to uh, the 2nd of December is the USRM Orbit and Resilience uh, Global Virtual Conference. Um, so day one will be uh, governance and policy, day two is academic input, and day three will be community engagement. So look, guys, all the information is available uh, through info at theisrm.org. Um, just from the ACES perspective, we currently have 63 ACES professionals in the Irish chapter, uh, which is 41% of the chapter has a professional ACES qualification, which is the highest per capita in the world, and both as a chapter and as a country. Um, and just to let anyone who does want to do the CPP course, Pat Nolan is running a CPP prep course um, and as part of a study group. So look, guys, I'm, I'm finished. That's my blurb. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Ray. Uh, Ray Goggins, I'll, I'll, uh, I think everybody knows who Ray is, judging by the, the, the people on the, on the panel or judging by the people who've, who've, who've attended. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Ray. Uh, thanks, Gary. Uh, listen, great to be here, everyone. Um, I was delighted to get the invite from Gary uh, a couple of weeks ago. And look, it's great that it worked out that I could, you know, talk to you today and maybe shed some light. Um, I suppose as a former uh, member of ACES, um, I kind of lost touch because of different things, traveling away, went into different industries. And to be honest, it was a laziness on my part not keeping the link up. But I always had uh, very fond uh, memories of it. Great community, fantastic support. And the conferences are legendary. Uh, if, if you get to go with any of them, it's pretty good. Um, so again, I'm not I'm not as familiar with the the institute guys with the strategic risk management. Um, that's all new to me. But look, welcome, lads. I'm delighted to talk. Um, it's what I'll talk about. Obviously, as it says on the tin there, I'll talk about resilience basically uh, for forty minutes or so, hopefully, until you get bored and I'll switch off, go for your lunch. Um, and it'll be my experience of resilience. Um, as opposed to something you know you might have got out of a book or somebody else is talking about but what I'd uh, what I'd like to get over for you guys is that it resonates with something that you do uh, it resonates with you in some way in your life um, in your profession and what you do on a daily basis uh, because it's important to understand that with resilience it's not something we do um, you know once a week or once a month you got to think about it on a daily basis so that, that's kind of where we're going um, okay so I'll start move on so who am I? So look, uh, that's me basically there on the first screen, the who but me uh, slide. So I'm probably known now, um, Ray Goggins is my name for anybody who's, you know, in from other countries or somewhere else who doesn't know who I am. Um, I'm known now as, uh, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, as the chief instructor on Ultimate Hell Week, um, which is basically a reality television program where we put a number of civilian recruits uh, through special forces training for a period of a week and basically we test their resilience that's that's what we do um, in, in essence um, on the left of the screen is uh, what i'm also known for now i'm the author of the best-selling um, ranger 22 which is basically a book about my insights career what i experienced and actually like what we're talking about today it is in essence for me a manual on my resilience and how I learned it and what I did. So I have to get that plug in there for the book lads before I go on. Um, so that's that's basically what I'm known for now. Um, what people don't understand is for 30 years before all this happened, this all just happened in the last kind of two years really. I started making a show and the book came out of that. Um, for 30 years before that, I, I served in various guises in the Irish uh, military. So. Um, I started off as an 18 year old um, joining in the army in Cork and joined the infantry uh, where, you know, that was my introduction to resilience, I guess, in military version of it. So as an 18 year old being put into this barracks, having to live with this group of 40 other guys and, you know, start 
fending for yourself almost in a way and start going through the army boot camp process um, of training. So I started in the end of 1989. Uh, so I'm an 80s soldier and uh, carried on into training into 1990. So what I did in that time frame was learn an awful lot about myself and my ability to cope. Um, so that, that part of my career then led me into my further infantry kind of career, uh, which was again in Cork in the 4th Infantry Battalion, where I spent like, you know, uh, nine years almost working in that environment where I traveled overseas um, a number of times where I was deployed on United Nations peacekeeping missions um, to Lebanon, which were pretty... Uh, Pretty different, I guess. Um, so you're you're deploying to the Middle East. It's a war zone, so there's a lot going on. Uh, people often kind of see peacekeeping as look, yeah, you're there in the blue body armor and the blue flag, and everyone is kind of obeying what you say. It's the opposite. Anyone, any military guys out there watching this or who have experience of that, realize like you're the bullet stop. You're the one in the middle of the the fighting, the factions that are fighting. You're the one that's trying to protect the civilians. You're the one that's trying to help everybody out. You're also the one that's the biggest target because, as I said, you're in lovely blue helmets and blue body armor. You have lovely white painted vehicles and all the walls of your buildings are painted super white. So it's a perfect reference point for any artillery or anybody doing attacks and anybody else to use the UN post for cover. So that, that's kind of where it all started. So I pushed on from there into special operations after about nine years. Uh, special operations is like it's a different world and um, great respect for my infantry days learned so much but when you step into the special operations world it, it's a new world um, you're stepping into that gray area of um, direct action intelligence kind of world as well as all the normal military conventional and um, anti-terrorist type stuff so like it's it's full on uh, the process to get in there is pretty insane um it's in my day, it was four weeks of um, absolute, absolute hell. And when you, if, if you finish that, the survivors were bandaged up for a week and then they were sent on a four to six month training program, which was called skills training at the time, to basically instilling that uh, special forces mindset, skill set, and um, ability to be effective in all environments is what they're doing to you. So that's an incredible step in resilience, which I'll refer to more later as we, as we talk. So moving on from that, uh, I retired six years ago and uh, left the military behind me and went straight into a civilian protection role as a protection officer for MasterCare, would you believe? So there wasn't a whole lot of resilience involved in my first operation because I was a team leader for a security detail for MasterCare and their CEO and, and global heads at the Rugby World Cup in London in 2015. So it was a bit of a jolly, really. Um, so I kind of got spoiled uh, in that for a year. Then went back to some real work then. Uh, if you pardon my French, no insult to the MasterCard setup. It's brilliant to learn so much. Fantastic corporate um, identity and abilities. But I went back to Afghanistan for three years um, as a protection uh, stroke operations manager, where obviously my resilience was tested on a daily basis because uh, it was pretty full on, I guess. Um, then whilst there, the whole Hell Week thing kicked off, did the first few series of that. I worked for um, a fashion app for a year, which I didn't think you'd hear that one, and ran one of the biggest uh, e-com fashion shoots in the country. So there you go, there's resilience there for you. Um, and then my company at the moment, I started a training company, started this year called Core Skills Training. So this type of work I do, you know, team building resilience and so on. So that's kind of where I am to now. Okay, so I'll move on. So our agenda, lads, okay? I won't, um, I'm looking at about 40 minutes ish or less uh, of me waffling, and then we'll have a bit of a question and answer through Gary at the end. If you have anything you want to bring up, anything you want to add, please do. Like, I'm not the all singing, all dancing advocate of this. Like, everyone has something to bring to the table in this. Everyone has a lesson learned and something they want to add. Um, so what, you, what I'll talk about in resilience to me is my philosophy on resilience, um, my Kind of experience of resilience and what it means to me um, i'll talk about you know where i learned about resilience and look obviously i'll be leaning heavier on uh, the special operations side of stuff and where i worked as a private security contractor um how i worked on resilience and how i still do that now um so maybe some insights or some techniques you mightn't be familiar with and finally we'll have that question that i mentioned about so again um we, we, we i'll try and keep it relatively brief 
So just before I go into uh, what, what I'm going to talk about, just, just for two or three minutes, I'd like you to get a piece of paper now. And I just want you to go through this process for yourself because I want you to be thinking about resilience for you what I'm talking and being able to relate it. So what I want you to do for the next minute or two, and again, just to explain to you, this isn't for public. We're not going to be bringing this up at the end of the, of the, the event where we're going to be talking about our deepest, darkest secrets. I just like you to go through a little exercise for yourself. So where you've, your resilience has been tested in the past year or beyond that, if you want, um, how you coped with it, uh, what you did um, to fix it, uh, what worked, what didn't, and did you help someone while you were doing that? So if you just spend two minutes there on the clock and just have a think about that and write it down and keep it with you, please. And you can refer to it for the rest of the brief. Okay, if you just give it about another 30 seconds there now, everyone, and uh, we move on. Okay, just keep that with you and we refer to it in a little while. Okay, I'll move on. Right, the key pointer, what is resilience? Okay, there's loads of different versions of resilience. You could ask 10 people in the military, in security, law enforcement, doctors, nurses, bakers, everyone will have a different version of it because it's all unique to themselves and how they judge it in their heads. Uh, for me, what is resilience? Uh, my version of it and how I, what, what it means to me is it's basically just for me, it's the ability to endure adversity, um, whatever that is, however that comes at me, um, and the ability to effectively keep going. When I say effectively, it means that you're not just surviving at this stage, you're actually being an effective part of a task, you're an effective part of a mission, event, whatever you're doing, regardless of what's going on around you, you're able to be effective in what you do. Um, another kind of part of it, I guess, is that bounce back ability, which is a huge part of it you're understanding that things will change for you, that what you plan to do and what actually happens are rarely the same thing. There's often things that'll happen that'll keep you, you know, maybe down an alleyway or down a different track or it won't go the way you planned it to go. So that's dealing with change and diversity which is a huge part of resilience. It's something you need to be aware of and understand that it, it, that's what, the way it comes. So if you have that much alone, you're, you're, you're a long way to being resilient. We used to say in the military, and, and Gary will remember this, and anyone else there, that you know, no plan survives contact. So no matter how much or how much detail you go into planning, no plan survives contact. It won't go the way you planned, so you always need to have a plan B. You need a plan B, even a plan C. You need something to fall back on where your initial option one doesn't work. You need something else. And that's a key pointer for resilience, that you know, keeps you effective. People who don't have plan B, who don't have fallback, they're the people that end up being unsuccessful or not being able to complete their task. A bit, another big part of resilience for me is that ability to hope for the best. You have to understand and hope and visualize that, yeah, this is what's going to happen. This is my plan. Now, if you don't get to that, okay, that's fair enough. But you have to hope for the best. At the same time, you have to prepare for the worst and things going completely going to skew. So a big part of it for me is dealing with things going wrong. If you have that ability to do that and not lose the plot or throw the plan out the window because one aspect of it didn't work or all of it didn't work, you have to be able to understand how to reset and move on from there. Okay, so that's a huge part. Of it. Um, for me then as well, you're looking at like the mistake culture. You know, it's people have like making mistakes doesn't make people bad people. Like I've made mistakes left, right and center. Like 
every day from the military days before it after it i'll make a few mistakes today um but it's your ability to understand you're going to do that and to be able to forgive yourself to move on from it you know like there, there's a phrase i heard recently about uh, you know someone driving a car that the, the mirror is smaller than the the windscreen because you need to see what's coming at you and where you're going like what happened behind you yeah learn the lesson from it but, and look at it a little bit don't stare at it move on okay that's a big part of it as well when i served in special forces and beyond it um, even when you had these plans made these ideal scenarios arranged military precision everyone knew their job everyone knew the task that was going to happen things still went wrong okay and even if you do everything perfectly people still die people still get killed things go wrong people get injured plans fall apart so you have to have that mindset to understand that for me as well a big part of it is with having mentioned mindset with everything you do in your life you guys are on the security business and, and different things and strategies intelligence and so on like it's, it's a constantly moving and evolving environment so you should be very used to change and diversity and things going differently for you it's all about your mindset to that so if you have the right mindset going forward about where you're going if you have the right mindset nothing can stop you doing what you're doing eventually if you have the wrong mindset nothing can help you like you're, you're doomed before you even start because you, everything comes from the inside out doesn't matter how fancy your kid is how good your team is if you're the leader or the main person there if you're if you're not wired right on the inside and you're prepared and focused it's just not going to happen to you if you look at a picture it's it's a picture we took from hell week it's not like some post-apocalyptic um place it's one of the students down in coraclaw beach in east um the east coast of ireland there if you're watching this from outside so it kind of paints a picture for what resilience is this guy concentrating on his task and he's just keeping going, pushing that log in front of him with his team. So it's it's understanding for him. It looks the picture looks like it's a physical thing he's doing. Yeah, it is. It's physical. He's hurting. He's in pain. He's feeling a lot of things going on there. But more importantly, he's using his physical resilience, of course, but also his mental and emotional resilience is huge. To to understand how those three connect and work together, it's a key factor. And you need to if you get the three of those lined up, however you do that you're you're in an absolutely better place for resilience okay what does a test what does resilience test for everyone okay you had your little exercise that you did there for yourselves but resilience tests everything it, it tests like you know your resilience is tested by situations basically life itself and it's tested by other people mainly and sometimes even yourself so these are all the things you need to be aware in that change and that kind of you know environment um look we're all off hopefully out of covid uh, which was like a global shutdown for two years nothing like it since like probably the ice age that affected every country race creed up the business operation nobody was immune to it so that's probably one of the biggest mm -hmm. points of um what resilience is and probably what everyone will relate to now in a global sense um, your job obviously as well is a huge part of it i just give you a few examples um not even just getting to work sometimes your commute tests your resilience you know when you're in work then your pressure your interactive relationships with others what activity you're doing deadlines all these things a huge part of your resilience as well comes from your health that tests it so obviously you're looking at serious illness you're looking at injury and you're looking at your mental health which is again a huge part of it and this is a step into that just a kind of a, a fact for you like when you're injured or when you're unwell like your your negativity rate goes up by 20 percent. so you're 20 percent more negative this is a test done by i think it was navy seals something like that back in the day uh, to test that with guys so it's it's an important one Obviously, then moving on, uh, you're looking at the likes of bereavement, um, of course, which is another protract protracted and unique way to test your resilience because it's not something that's an event that happens and it's over. It goes on for weeks, months, years, even life, depending on some cases. Just recently, last month, our family pet at home, we had, had to be put to sleep. So it was catastrophic for the whole family and like trying to work on work beyond that. 
you know, so it just gives you a, a slight example. Relationships as well is a big one. Um, not necessarily your most important relationship is the one you have with yourself and how you view yourself, how you project yourself. If you don't get that one right for a start, you're, on, you're, you're going nowhere. You're not going to be resilient. You're not going to move on. You're not going to be effective. And obviously then relationships with others is incredibly important. Um, so you need to understand your strengths, your weaknesses, and how you relate to that. So you need to know what you're not good at. And you need to know what you're good at. So when you're doing something and you're going towards a crisis situation, it doesn't have to be you as a leader or as a, a team member doing all the work. You can spread the wealth and use people for their skill sets. And it's okay if you're not good at something. It's okay. You don't have to beat yourself up. That's part of your resilience process. Um, obviously, personality is a huge part of it. We all have different amounts of resilience. Gary was saying to me before we came on there with children, it's a very good point that, like, you know, when a child is learning to walk, they'll fall hundreds of times a day and they'll keep getting up, they'll keep getting up, which is probably the best way to coin resilience in effect. And I think that's the way it needs to be for us in our lives and in our, our work, what we do. It's just that ability to keep getting back up. So, again, um, and finally, uh, the last part of it, like moving. One of the biggest stressors is moving anywhere. Um, so moving house, moving office, moving locations. People are in the process now of moving from home where they've been all watching this morning and drinking coffee in their underpants, going back to office spaces, going back to meetings. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a stress for everybody. And I'll just give you a personal example of moving. For me, when I did work in Afghanistan, um, I was on a, uh, like a, a two-month split. So two months in, two months in Kabul, a month out. So obviously, look, you're in Afghanistan, you need to be resilient, you need to be prepared for what's coming on a daily basis. It changes in a heartbeat, obviously enough. So I was ready for that, going in, be prepared, getting ready in the plane before I land. Uh, what I wasn't prepared for was on my downtime, the month off coming home, my mindset before I came on to my family, having a month off and slotting back into that lifestyle of home, of routine, of life, of hanging out the washing, doing the dinner, school runs, all those things. It brings its own form of resilience as well for iPhone for me. And it's something I actually had to work on. So it was times I was actually as nervous flying into Dublin as I was flying into Kabul. Um, so my wife wasn't too happy with that one. Okay, so where did I learn it? I learned resilience like all of us. We mentioned, I mentioned the child there walking earlier. So I started off, look, I'm the youngest of a family of eight, uh, born and reared in the north side of Cork City. Um, hadn't much money working class area, rough enough, a lot of crime. So to get through that, you need to be resilient for a start. Um, I also went to a all boys Christian brother school, which is like survival of the fittest. So resilience was a, a key factor there as well. And again, we learn all this by osmosis. And we learn it by, you know, as a byproduct of all the other things we're doing um, in, in reality. So it builds up our ability to do it. So I was lucky. I was pretty resilient starting off. And I suppose I was always destined for the career I chose in the end. Um, so for me then as well, uh, pushing on how I learned my resilience. I mentioned earlier about joining the army, which was a huge part of it for me, uh, where I, you know, being able to stand on your own or as part of a team and be part of a resilient organization that means you have to be able to move forward. You have to, have to deal with situations as they occur, for example, in Lebanon and so on um, at the time. Uh, so it was absolutely full on. Um, in my career then, I, I followed on that I became like a junior NCO, a corporal's course, which is a couple of months teaching how to lead patrols, teaching how to be an instructor. Then I deployed with, um, again, back to Lebanon in a UN mission as a corporal. So you're leading small patrols, you're organizing small missions, which build your resilience because it shows you that you're able to do this, you're able to deal with this um, event. So you, you kind of you move on quite quickly and you learn from it. I'll talk more about how we learn it later on. So that was a big part of it for me. Um, so moving on then, I suppose the biggest learner for me for resilience was when I decided to go to special forces because I had, um, I had tested and I tried out for um, what's called selection in 1992 as like a 21 year old, you know, with very little preparation and just decided here, I'm going to go down and try this. It was called Selection Course Zulu. There was 128 guys started. I'm not even sure how many finished, but I wasn't one of them who finished up because I quit because it was extremely intense, physically, mentally, emotionally, and I wasn't prepared. I was super fit, 
but I had never been at that position where, you know, I was always a good soldier. I was never really tested too much. I was probably at 75, 80% of my ability in my military, in my army career. But this was like the, the starting position for this was 100% all the time. So that kind of burns into you. And for me, it was a huge lesson learned. And I failed the course. I quit. I put my hand up and I said, okay, I'm quitting here. I'm out of here. Um, and that wasn't good. That's a hard thing to do for me. And I was, it, it broke me. And I was incredibly, incredibly hard on myself at the time about it. And it took me a lot of years to actually really understand and realize why it hadn't worked for me, why I hadn't been resilient enough to get through the training. So what I learned from it was three things, basically. For me, for resilience, resilience comes out of your preparation. If you're ready, if you're prepared for something, even if it doesn't go according to plan, at least you have a plan. You have something to start off and baseline from. That's incredibly important. The second thing I didn't do on that first selection course is I didn't commit to the course. and I didn't believe that I could pass the course. So if you don't believe that, if you don't have that, what I call the why, the reason why, your purpose for doing anything is incredibly important. If your why isn't strong enough, you'll quit, you'll give up, you won't do it. If your why is strong enough, that's the biggest voice in your head. And the ones telling you to stop then will be drowned out by that why. The how and the what don't matter once the why is good. If the why is your strongest drive, again, it goes back to the mindset I said earlier. If you have the right mindset, nothing can stop you. If you have the wrong mindset, nothing will help you. So that's the lesson I learned on that first course. So for me then, I had to reset. It took me a couple of years, to be honest, back on the loop, learned different skills, worked on my own resilience by building myself as best as I could. And I'll talk to you about how to do that now in a second. And then went back on selection the second time round. So that difference between what was called selection course Zulu and selection course Golf One were poles apart. So I was completely prepared. I was ready for things to go wrong. When I went on the first one, I thought, yeah, I'm brilliant. I'm the best lad here. I'm going to get everything perfect. I'm going to get everything fantastic. I didn't. And when I started making mistakes and realized I wasn't good, I started to worry. I started to undermine myself. Whatever bit of self-belief I had was cut away because I hadn't, I wasn't resilient enough to keep going and have that goal. Second time round, different story. I was completely focused. I trained. I had my mindset. I was ready to go. And no matter what came at me, I was going to get through that course. And that's the mindset I had all the time on it. So they're the reasons why I failed the first time around on selection. So moving on to the next phase for me where I learned resilience. So selection, as hard as it is, it's training. And all the other training events and you know, the combat divers course, all these other tough courses, long range reconnaissance LERP. You know, I was reconnaissance specialist by trade. So then reconnaissance commanders courses, all involving walking over mountains, carrying ridiculous amounts of kit and being in your soul where you have to drive yourself on. So I'm building my, my resilience. So when I deployed on a mission, my first mission to East Timor, I'm wondering, okay, why does the train have to be so hard? Why do I have to be so prepared? Why do I have to be so ready for things to change and ready for hardship? So my first insertion operation is probably the hardest thing I've physically done emotionally done and spiritually done in my life which involved a jungle march at night carrying a lot of equipment over a mountain jungle area into an operation site that took like probably 14 15 hours a six-man team on our own so there was no quit i couldn't stop those guys lives were in my hands and vice versa so i had to keep going so in that moment as i was fighting my way through this jungle and so on and so forth I had that epiphany of why the training has to be so hard and why your ability to be resilient needs to be constant and you need to train on it all the time. So that's the lesson I took away from that mission, among, among other things. If you look at the picture, that's actually from East Timor. So I'm the kind of group, the spectre on the far left. Um, we were dropped on, not that operation I mentioned, but another one. So... Yeah, so that's kind of what we were dealing with. So I learned a lot in that. Um, I suppose then from then moving on into operations, that realized the resilience issue for me, um, why it has to be so important because you're, you're deployed. I deployed in loads of other places. I'm not going to go into all the ones I did, 
I'll just give you some of the general ones. So Africa, all these other places and so on with good teams and good people who are resilient in so many different ways, physically, emotionally, mentally resilient. Again, the key is getting them all ready. Um, a big part of it as well I learned about resilience for me is when things go absolutely pear-shaped. I was unfortunate to be in, involved in uh, a number of blasts in Afghanistan, but one, the one in particular I'm going to talk about is one. It was in the, the winter of, tw sorry, January of 2019, uh, midwinter. So a truck bomb near compound I was in with 120 civilians or so, and about a 20 or 25 man security team. Um, we had fatalities instantly in the blast. So my job for seven hours after that blast was dealing with what was, who was trying to come in and basically getting people out of, you know, collapsed rooms, injured, badly wounded, getting everybody to a safe zone. And eventually with the help of a team, of course, evacuating those people to a safer location. So my resilience, I was building and training all my military career. Um, so I pushed on into this world. And I realized that the key factor about it is, you know, to plan five minutes ahead. So take that small task and complete it. Another key factor for me is the art of being composed and being calm. However you manage to do it, if you can stay calm in any environment, it's actually a superpower. I've said this before. It gives you strength first. You can you concentrate on yourself. Anyone around you then, builds off that strength, whether you're, it's your teams, your civilians. So picture the scene, we're in a blasted corridor that had with steel doors and concrete that I had as a safe location for people. Pitch dark, winter's night, minus seven, 120 various types of civilians injured, crying, looking at me to get to, to keep them alive and get them out. So I had to be completely focused on that task and rely on my resilience to get that done. Okay, so how do we become resilient? There's three ways we become resilient, all right? Okay, and it's not just about the whole special force of snake eating stuff. Yeah, there's every job you do, no matter what your job is, it's the same process. So the first thing is we get it by learned skills. So going on courses, training, you know, weapons training, and whatever it is you're doing, computers, all these things, because it builds your self-belief in yourself because you have either physical, mental, intellectual skills that you can do to make things better for you and be effective. So that, that's a big part of being resilient, learning those skills. Um, as I'm talking about now, this whole brief is about previous experience, which is a huge part of it for all of us. So we learn by making that mistake. Once we understand how to differentiate the disappointment from the lesson learned, so you understand that, okay, I've made that mistake. I'm not going to do it again, or I'm not going to do it the same way. So you go back, you reset, you go again. So experience is a huge part of it. And personality, as I mentioned earlier, is a huge part of resilience also because you need, some people have different amounts of resilience. And look, you can train resilience. You can make it better for yourself. You can, absolutely. Um, it's all in your control. And like that whole worry, fear, anxiety process can be controlled. You can manage it. Fear isn't necessarily a negative. Fear can be a good thing. It drives us to excel. It keeps us at our highest level. Worry, the thing with me with worry is, if you, yeah, you worry about the things you can affect, but the stuff you can affect, don't even think about it. It doesn't matter. Someone else deals with that. You need to be able to do that to be resilient in a crisis or any sort of environment. Because if you're pulling in worries, you're sitting up with, worrying about, is there going to be a car crash on the N7 in the morning? You're, you're not going to get anything done. You need to be focused, okay? So it's very important. It's also important to remember that the mind is only wired for survival only. So anything that we try and do outside that, including success, the brain sees as a threat, as a danger, and it'll set those kind of conditions of fight, flight, or freeze in you, which is a huge part of it. So a lot of the stuff that we don't do, it's not because of others, or it's not because of the environment outside us. It's because of insight, the voices inside that tell us, oh, you can't do that. Stop doing that. It stops you being resilient. So it's important to make that link with those voices and keep on them all the time. Keep those voices in check. Keep talking to them. It's incredibly important. So 
So just the mindset principles for it. Just some simple stuff um, for, for you guys to see. Uh, they're very simple. There's five principles of it. So the first one for your resilient mindset for whatever you do is awareness. Like you got to be aware of what's going on, first of all, inside, like in your head, your thought process, how you think, like how negative, positive you are. That's incredibly important. So you got to keep an eye on that. Okay. Then you think you're got to be aware of your outside factors that are influencing what you're doing for you to be resilient. So what's going on around you? What do you need to address? What do you need to do immediately? What do you need to do not too much of a hurry? And what do you not need to do at all? That's when it all comes into play there. Okay. Um, acceptance is a huge part of resilience. Accepting that you're not perfect. Accepting that your team isn't perfect. Accepting that there's no such thing as 100%. But you strive for that. You go with the best plan. And if it doesn't work, you have options left to right and up the middle to do something else if that's what happens. So you got to understand that and accept that issue with you. Okay. The willingness one is obviously very straightforward. Um, you got to be willing to keep going. It's so simple. Like it comes back to what I said, your why. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this event? Why are you doing this job? Why are you doing this? Whatever it is in your life, this goal. That's what you got to be absolutely clear on so that's incredibly important the present moment is an absolute huge one so you got to focus i mentioned it earlier in the afghan bomb thing so every task i did i concentrated on that specific task for that five minutes digging somebody out covering this whatever i was doing right i wasn't thinking about what i was going to do two hours later i wasn't thinking about you know what happened the week before you got to be present in what's going on and give what you're doing at that time 100 percent of your attention and it makes things a lot lot better and the final part and probably a huge one is self-belief like self-belief is again a trainable and attainable uh, commodity like how does self-belief come around so you get your self-belief by training you get your self-belief by knowledge of your subject of, of what you're doing you get your self-belief by being prepared you get your self-belief by having a good team around you, having good people that you know you can rely on, that have your back. You get self-belief from your equipment, your, your data, and you get it from what you've done previously. It's incredibly important. There's also a system of what's called psychological safety in a team. So it means if someone makes a mistake or gets something wrong, they aren't dragged over the coals, they're not battered because people understand that it's a mistake. So if you give people that option where if they make a general mistake, they're not going to get flogged. It means people can be more effective. They'll be more resilient. They'll push further and they'll be stronger in what they do. Okay. A huge part of resilience is positive thinking. Okay. You have to, your outlook has to be good. I'm not saying you have to be Mary Poppins and everything has to be coated in sugar, but you have to be absolutely positive. You look at the guys in the picture climbing that ladder. Like they know they're getting to the top because they can't have a, a doubt that they're going to do it. Because if they fall under the, the, the screws of that ship, they're dead. Okay. And that, that's the reality of it. So that positive outlook um, is, is incredibly important. If you don't see yourself, visualize yourself doing something, it's not going to happen for you. Okay. So it also brings with that positive versus negative. If you have a positive mindset about what you're doing, that, that, that can do attitude instead of that I can't do it if you have that I can do it it means it becomes a challenge not a problem it means you have motivation not issues not you know you're not having difficulty everything is good you're positive you're going forward and you have hope and you have the ability and the belief that you're going to complete what you're going to do that's incredibly important okay so also that positive thinking piece, you know, your the change of it comes into, I keep mentioning change, because change is the key. You have to be fluid, you have to be flexible in everything you do. There's be three acronyms in the army, no matter what you did in the army. Okay, what are the characteristics of attack? What are the characteristics of defense, whatever? There was always simple, which is incredibly important. There was always flexibility of the two. Okay, so the other one would always vary but there's always simplicity, there's always flexibility. So if you have that in your resilient planning, 
flexibility and sim simplicity. It means you can move left and right, you can change. Okay, it's incredibly important. Um, so the second thing I'm going to talk about on that is your self-talk, which is incredibly important. So again, I mentioned about relationships and the relationship with yourself is the key relationship at all times. You got to understand yourself. You got to know yourself. So you got to keep that talk going. So that self-talk to you, it increases your ability, increases your motivation. It increases your confidence and increases your ability to be effective just by telling yourself, I can, I can do this. Okay. So you can encourage yourself. It's incredibly important. And also, if you do get things wrong, yeah, you got to understand why they went wrong, but you got to be kind to yourself on it as well as your team. Okay, that's incredibly important. Yeah, tactical breathing, really quickly. Okay, tactical breathing is something that we learned by osmosis back in the day when I was in special operations. We used to do it, we just learned it ourselves. I've done it in martial arts and training, but what it is, is it's an ability to compose yourself and relax yourself prior to maybe a crisis event or something like that. We used to do it, say if you're formed up to go in a building like in a SWAT team uh, uh, formed up along the door. It's just a five second drill where you take two, a deep breath in through your nose for the count of two seconds and exhale for the count of four seconds. Just do that twice. And at the same time, you're just thinking about, okay, what am I going to do here in the first five seconds? That's all you think about. You br bring it down to that simple step. It's called tactical breathing. It works for teams. It works for military. It works for everything, really. Okay. You can even do it yourself. You know, when you're sitting in your office, you can do it in your car. It makes you calm. It brings you that composure and that ability to get your head and arse in gear for what you need to do. Okay. It's, it's, it's a, a very simple technique, but incredibly effective. Okay. So I'm coming here to the end now. So what's your takeaway from today for you guys okay it's up to you whatever you take out of this whatever insight you may or may not given from from me or taken up um for me the takeaway is resilient people are usually people who get things done they're successful people regardless of mistakes regardless of not being perfect regardless of all the things i mentioned they're usually people who have a simple flexible plan and to have a plan B, to have a fallback and to have an understanding of what they're good at and what they're not good at. Another part of it is they visualize the success. They visualize where they're going to be. They have a timeline. They have their goals set and they work to that goal. If they don't get it the first time, they go again and again and again. That's the key factor. And the important one are there are people who keep contact with those voices inside that tell you you can't or tell you to stop. You need to get those voices constant so you know what they sound like so you can tell them to shut up when they're in your ear that's what's very important so to finish on resilience to me the resilience is that ability to remain effective and to make the best of any situation regardless of what's going on okay so that's basically me everyone so time wise and i'll take any questions though gary if you want to slot in there Grand, well, look, Ray, thanks so much for, um, for, for, for doing the presentation. It was, it was fascinating from my perspective. Um, in, in your book and in the presentation, you talk about psychological safety. So yeah. where do you draw the line on incompetence and that, you know, someone making cost, constant mistakes? Yeah, you, good point, Gary. Yeah. So like for, for, for me, the whole um, psychological safety piece is for a genuine mistake of, you know, like if someone's constantly making mistakes, you can't live with that. Like you have to, it's up to you in your own organization, what your scale is for incompetence. Like, you know, if you have a document on it, I, I don't know. But um, if you have, like we used to call them red line incidents when I was in the military and beyond. So if someone is, makes a red line mistake, you know, you can't make too many of them. And then you're looking at maybe further training, possible dismissal. But like, yeah, it's a fine line to dance, to be honest, Gary. And you, you probably have to figure out for yourself. But, uh, oh, and, and, and it's the same. It's the same. It's the same here in, in where I work in Vanguard. We have a lot of psychological safety, yeah. but there is a point where you know you, you're gone too far. No, you're right, and you have to be careful not to have it a situation where la people can think, "Oh, I can do what I want." It's psychological safety. I can do anything here. It has to be a legitimate mistake. If they're if they're like you know not doing their due diligence and not paying attention to stuff, then I'd be cutting the legs off them in a heartbeat. Like yeah. Okay, and just around the, the self belief. Um, element right and positive thinking and confidence has there any times you ever suffered from that kind of imposter syndrome have i suffered from that imposter syndrome as in yeah. why am i as, here as, or why 
Yeah, yeah. That, you yeah, know, I, I had it this morning. Uh, I did um, a photo shoot in the GPO for a couple of authors from the, you know, that are up, up for awards or something this year. And I felt completely like I shouldn't be there because you'd all these super intelligent people who wrote these fantastic books. I just wrote a book about stuff I saw, I felt, and I smelt. That's what I wrote about. So, I, yeah, I actually got that this morning. But other than that, have I got it before? Not so much. You know, maybe taste of it. That like you're not good enough, but we all get that. But you got to bring it back down to start concentrating on your positives. OK, get that negative thought out. Understand the negative thought. OK, that's undermining you. Don't yeah. ignore it because it'll come back and bite you in the arse. Be, yeah. be curious of the thought. Yeah. And then what you need to do then is label it as a negative thought. OK, it's, I'm telling myself I'm not good enough. And then it's only a thought. It's not a fact. We probably all get thoughts like that 10 times a day. It's not yeah. a fact. So you, you push on. You concentrate then on what the important thing is. Bring your purpose back into play, what you're doing. Bring your why back in and then focus on something positive for yourself. Okay, I can do this. Get your small little event done where your confidence builds again and move on from there. That's kind of what I did practically. Okay. Just a, a question from Brian. Is all resilience equal? As in the resilience that a person might, might need for an office environment, would that be different maybe to the, the resilience needed in a military environment? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, it is like resilience is very personal um, to individuals and situations. And like, you know, for example, I'd be incredibly resilient in like some mad situation, but stick me into Tesco to do the shopping and I'd probably have a meltdown. Do you know what I mean? So it is very specific to what you're doing, but you can train it for individual things. So like if, if you train your resilience in general, you can do that. But I tell you what I do. I do like mad PT session once a week for my body and my mind. So it's the closest I can get those negative voices coming at me on a weekly basis. So I keep that connection with them. Um, so that's what I do. But there's loads of things you can do to you know, give yourself a little bit of adversity. A small bit of hardship is good for you because it builds your resilience. And it means when you have your downtime and you enjoy stuff, you really enjoy it then. You, know, you become yeah. much more grateful about what's going on in your life, the positive things. If you, if you give yourself that little bit of a dart now and again. Oh, oh, absolutely. Anybody else? Any questions for Ray? I think you scared everybody else off, Ray. <laughs> and I wore my glasses and all, so I wouldn't look rough. <laughs> I even put a tie on. I know, you look lovely there, Gary. No, just a lot of people kind of saying, look, thanks a million. Great, great, uh, great presentation. And um, we, we people from uh, Addis Ababa, one of your former colleagues, he was out there now. Uh, Jonathan Pym, he's out there. Oh, is he? So, oh, brilliant. He, he, he's on the call and we've... we've uh, I haven't seen Jonathan for a long time. Good stuff. We, we you, good, good to see you. We've guys from Western Canada and from Texas. Very good. Um, Ray, I think that's it. Uh, sorry, uh, when, when you're having tough, tough days, what do, you, what do you focus on primarily? Yeah. Okay, I pick, I pick three positives if I can. If I can only pick one, I pick one. Um, but I pick three positives. It, it could be anything. Um, it might necessarily even be something that you're dealing with immediately. So give you that one thing that gives you your setting. I, I call it my baseline. So I know I can get back to, for example, like I know I'm good at, say, dealing with people or something like that. Or I know I'm good at talking to people, for example. I bring it back to something like that. Or you could be good at, like, you know, organizing a team. You could be good at logistics. So bring it back to your three positives and work off that. And on those really bad days, just stay in that zone. Don't even do stuff outside that zone if you can help it. And it gets you, it gets you through. It gets you over that hump where you can start building your confidence again, your belief, and you start moving forward. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I think I think that's it. I don't think we have um I don't think we have any, have any any more. We've just a lot of people saying, you know, great talk, loved loved the presentation. Um and, and look, thanks so much for, for from from ISRM and from 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 ASUS uh, or chapter. Look, Ray, thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, listen, Gary, thanks again. Look, I, I enjoyed it. I, I hope people take something out of it that they can do in their work and at home. Um, yeah, look, it, it's a huge thing, and look, I'm delighted to chat about it. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Ray. Nice one. Thanks. Look, Gary. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye.